What's up guys, welcome back to the Daily Stock Picks. And in this video, we'll be going over the top four blue chip stocks that you should consider buying right now in September 2020. So just to give you guys a heads up, this is based on an article that I read from Investor's Place. So what I'll be doing for you guys is I'll be reading over this article along with the four stocks that I've selected out of the 10 that were mentioned in this article, commenting and will be conducting my own quantitative analyses to see whether those four blue chip stocks either belongs in our dividend portfolio or our value portfolio by using this checklist. So if you guys feel like being amazing and if it, this well video gives you a lot of value make sure that you smash the like button for the youtube algorithm guys i would really appreciate it now without a further ado let's get this video started so 10 blue chip stocks ideal for any investor so out of these 10 blue chip stocks as i mentioned previously four of these seems to be really attractive so that we can either buy it right now at the current valuations or we can add it to our watch list so that it can pr come down to a particular target so 10 blue chip stocks ideal for any investor the large caps aren't just safer but they can also provide surprisingly robust upside by josh anomoto investor place contributor even in the best of circumstances, blue chip stocks hardly inspire much enthusiasm and tension, uh, particularly among younger investors. Sure, they make up core holdings of our retirement portfolio, but as an individual play, many, if not most people, are angling for hot growth names. Not necessarily industry giants after all. You're probably not going to get rich by getting betting on companies everyone knows about. That sentiment is multiplied tenfold during the novel CBPD. Initially, virtually everything crashed at the onset of the crisis, but as Wall Street digested the dynamics of the new normal, the usual suspects, as in the sexy high flyers, stole most of the limelight. Not too many excited about gambling on blue chip stocks. And that's largely because electing blue chip stocks is high, hardly what you call gambling. If you want to have your 100 bagger potential, you can easily do so with over-the-counter exchanges. Bear in mind that 90% of the startups fail. With such grangly bad odds, you will soon end up in the poor house if you're not careful. Immediately, such a high failure rate should change your mind about high-risk growth ventures. Sure, they have potential, but potential doesn't pay the bills. On the other hand, you can improve your odds of success in the markets by sticking with proven blue chip stocks to buy. Their days of triple digit returns may be over, but these stalwarts dominate their industry for a reason. Best of all, tried and true organizations over the long run usually beat the benchmark S&P 500 index returns quite handily. And because many of them pay dividends, you can look very smart by just picking household names. Have I changed your mind yet? Here are 10 blue chip stocks to consider for a new way to approach profitability. So just to save you guys some time and reading this article and stuff, these are the four companies that I've selected. I'll be reading those part of the articles and we'll be going directly to our analysis portion. So finally, one last nugget of wisdom. Uh, while there's nothing wrong with chasing the latest Robin Hood fad in the new normal, most of these wagers uh, run counter to their fundamentals. But with blue chip stocks, you have greater assurance of staying coupled with reality. Therefore, these 10 companies are likely to leave you scratching your head or less likely to leave you scratching your head. Now, the first company in this list that I've selected for you guys is Home Depot, ticker symbol HD. One of the few constants in the broader, uh, broader retail space is Home Depot. During these severe disruptions, whether there that be hurricanes, earthquakes, or in case of pandemic, the home improvement and furnishings giant represents an essential service. However, calamities don't happen all the time. Thankfully, therefore, you might be tempted to discuss Home Depot stock as an investment with a narrow window of opportunity. But the facts say otherwise. 
True, Home Depot is a stalwart among blue chip stocks to buy that usually implies slow and boring growth. However, Home Depot stock has been surprising over the past two decades. Yes, shares lost an average of 3.4% annually in the 2000s, comparing unfavorably to the S&P 500 index loss of 2.3%. However, in a decade after, Home Depot stunned with an average return of 27%, well, uh, above the S&P 500 index return of 12%. So yes, Home Depot is boring, but boring can be very profitable. I truly agree with blue chip stocks and the dividend paying stocks. Those are like my favorite because just for owning the stock, the company or the management or the board of directors, directors decide to pay you year over year, every quarter uh, for just for owning the stock. You can do whatever you want with that money. If you want to increase the returns or pump up the returns with steroids in a way, you would be required to invest it or back into the same company so that you can compound the growth of your initial investment. Now let's have a look at Home Depot, ticker symbol HD. If you were to look at this uh, spreadsheet calculator, its current price to earnings multiple is 24.68, which is definitely cheaper than the S&P 500 index guys. So in terms of a S&P 500 index, yes, it seems to be cheaper. Now let's get to the good stuff, right? So in order for a company to meet my dividend portfolio, I proposed a checklist for myself after reading these three books, which I highly recommend checking out because they're really good reads if you want to create a dividend portfolio for yourself. Now, the first rule is that the current free cash flows must, and I mean must be positive. So. We want to be making sure that the company is actually bringing in money rather than just showing the money on paper, right? As like in the income statement. And that's why I like to look at the cash flow statement for the true representation of the cash flows that are coming into the business. And rule number two is that the dividends paid out should not be more than 75% of the current free cash flows. What do I mean by this? So generally, we want to be making sure that at least 25% of the free cash flows that the company produces, it should be retained by the business rather than paying out dividends because you never know what the future might entail. The company might come into some financial troubles and it might need to have the money or the company might find new business ventures that it can invest in. If it doesn't have sufficient capital, they wouldn't require to take a loan. Uh, rather than that, if they have sufficient cash flows, uh, stored in their balance sheet, they can utilize that. And rule number three is that it needs to have consistent dividend growth history of at least five years. Wonderful companies, they have an intention to increase the dividends, um, to increase the dividends year over year. And a rule of thumb, I like to look at five years or more than five years, which we'll be looking at in a couple of minutes. Now, the current dividend yield if it is greater than or equal to the five year dividend yield average, then we will consider buying the stock. That rule number four is basically a buy criteria, guys. Okay, so now looking at Home Depot, I like to use Y chats as you guys already know, uh, because they do a really good representation of this financial data in a visual format. And I'm more of a visual person, so I like to look at graphs and stuff rather than numbers. Hey, that's just me. And Home Depot, as we can see that the revenues are positive and the free cash, cash flows are also positive. So definitely the free cash flows are positive here. And let's see, it does pay out any dividend. So 5.958 divided by 11.04. If you divide that, it means that around 53%, or we can just round it down. So 50% of the free cash flows is being paid out as dividend and the remaining 50% can be re retained by the business in order to do other profitable ventures in order to be, that will be beneficial for the shareholders. So definitely meets the second criteria. Now let's see how consistent has Home Depot been increasing its dividends over the past uh, few years. So we can see that Home Depot has been increasing its dividends since, has been paying out dividends literally since 1990 and uh, Looking at this, it has been growing its dividends since the past 11 years at a rate of 19.71%. So just imagine guys, just for doing the same amount of work or just by owning the stock, they're increasing your dividends year over year on an annualized basis of 20%. 
over the long term that will compound your returns or supercharge your returns so yes definitely and even for conservative investors they can consider looking at this right now coming to the uh, current price target at the moment if you were to look at home depot we can see that the current dividend yield is 2.18 percent which is definitely higher than 2.10 so definitely it is a buy at this current price target of 269 dollars and 31 cents as a dividend portfolio just for fun guys i know that it is still a good right time to buy at the moment if you had invested in the company when it the dividend yield peaked over the past five years that would have been somewhere around march 20 of uh, march 20th of 2020 uh just for fun let's just check out the chart at that particular point in time right just for owning the stock at that particular point in time you would have gotten around 3.6 percent like an interest just for owning the stock and and the capital appreciation it was around 180 73 dollars at that particular point in time guys uh, 173 that's what i could find yep 269 divided by 173 you would have gotten nearly 50 percent return on your investment during this couple of two to three months or five months in a way at between three to five months 55 percent on your investment guys and you're getting paid of around 3.6 percent dividend just for owning the stock this is a definitely a long-term buy that you guys should consider looking at based on the current valuations and i think that the company can still go to newer highs based on the current valuation it is at now let's have a look and see if this meets our value criteria so in order for a company to meet my value portfolio basically it needs to meet five rules this time and these are the books that i recommend that you guys check out my personal favorite is this one the little book that still beats the market by joel greenblatt where he goes over his infamous magic formula of investing now the value portfolio the rule number one is that the return on invested capital must be greater than or equal to 10 percent so what do I mean by this? So this is basically a measure or a ratio that gives us the, how profitable the company is. So if it is more than 10%, it means that for every $100 that you invest into the business, $10, uh, the company is able to produce $10. Higher the number, the better it is. So you can call this, it's like a big brother of return on equity um, because I like to look at return on invested capital because it does consider the uh, long-term debt into calculation as well while calculating these returns which gives a true representation of its actual uh, actual returns now rule number two is that it needs to have a consistent cash flows so we want to be making sure that we can project the cash flows to the future to a certain extent based on the previous trend over the past 10 years and rule number three is that it needs to have a strong balance sheet we want to be making sure that the long-term debt on the balance sheet the company should be able to clear it off within six years or less than six lesser the number i mean lower the number the better now rule number four and rule number five are our buy criteria we only be want to be entering into the stock when the current price is at least at 80 percent times the uh times the fair value meaning that at least it is at a 20 percent discount or the margin of safety is at least 20 percent from its fair price and if sometimes rule number four isn't met we can base it purely on a pe ratio perspective when the current price to earnings multiple is less than 50 percent of the highest price to earnings ratio and it is lesser than the s p 500 index then you should consider looking at the stock as a value portfolio now looking at the value criteria let's just type in home depot here on y charts as you guys can see the return on invested capital is 40.37 percent which is absolutely bananas so the first rule is definitely met consistent cash flows let's have a look uh the revenues are almost linear to almost to a certain degree it's like a straight line guys and coming to the free cash flows we can see that it was around 3.5 billion dollars let's see how many times it's doubled over the past 10 years 3.5 double is 7 7 double is 14 so around 10 to 15 percent year over year increase over the past 
uh, past 10 years if you were to look at the growth estimates and does it have a strong balance sheet let's find out so it has around 34.85 billion dollars in long-term debt and the current assets is 31.36 so if you were to look at it 34.85 34.85 minus 31.36 that would equate to around $3.49 billion, which it can easily clear off with a single years of cash flow. So looking at this, according to my estimates, what I believe is that it should be able to clear off this long-term debt within a single 12 months of time frame, if the management chooses to do so. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. So just for you guys who don't know, current assets are basically the assets on the balance sheet which can be converted into liquid cash within 10 years or less or like within 12 months or less yeah and uh, now let's calculate its intrinsic value for this we need the earnings per share uh, figure so the earnings per share currently is 10.91 dollars per share and if you were to look at the price to earnings multiple oh, my mistake uh, Home Depot Price to earnings multiple, it has been trading somewhere around 14.84 and 28.78. And uh, so it's not definitely not at a discount when compared to the S&P 500. It is at a discount from the S&P 500 index, but it's not trading any time below its highs. Um, okay, now the analysts at Wall Street, they're estimating that the company could grow somewhere around 5.95%. By putting this plugging into the calculator, the most conservative intrinsic value comes around $218.41 per share. And if you were to anticipate a 15% return on your investment, you should be buying the stock at $62.09. As we all know, as we all know, just emphasizing, we never want to be buying the stock at the sticker price. We want to be buying it when it is at a discount, at least at a 20% discount from the retail price in a way. So $49 will be the absolute price target. Currently it's $269, yeah. So it won't be fitting as a discounted cash flow calculator, which this is, um, but let's see if it meets the rule number five. So is the current price to earnings ratio less than the 50% of the highest price earnings ratio, so 28.78 divided by two. So if it, the price earnings multiple was below 14%, then it would have definitely met the criteria, but it only meets part of it, which is cheaper than the S&P 500 index. In terms of a value prospects, I wouldn't be considering this as a part of a value portfolio, but if you are trying to invest this as a retirement portfolio, just hang on to home depot guys it's just gonna grow it has pretty good uh, return on invested capital numbers and now coming to the next company in this list is johnson and johnson ticker symbol j and j in recent years before the pandemic johnson and johnson was struggling mightily in the pr department multiple scandals made investors question whether johnson and johnson was worthy of consideration among blue chip stocks to buy so in a way the cvpd was exactly what the management needed with the raging pandemic not too many people are focused on johnson and johnson troubles indeed the company can do much to restore goodwill it's only one of many pharmaceutical companies developing a cvpd vaccine more importantly Johnson & Johnson has the capacity to produce a vaccine on a large scale. Therefore, Johnson & Johnson stock is an interesting pick if you want a reliable CVPD play. But even if you don't care about that, Johnson & Johnson stock is valuable for another reason. Like Procter & Gamble, it performs well during recessions. When the dust settled on 2009, the decade featuring the re Great Recession took down the major indices, but Johnson & Johnson delivered an annual return of 4.4%. That seems to be back in 2009. So this is definitely is a blue chip stock. Let's have a look at its current price to earnings ratio. Looking at it, it is cheaper when compared to the S&P 500 index, just by looking at that particular one. Now, coming to the uh, dividend um, screen, Johnson and Johnson type that in yes the revenues have been increasing 
the free cash flows haven't doubled at all so anticipate a less than five percent growth for the next five years uh, but the free cash flows are definitely a positive uh, that's no concerning matter uh, 19 so how much is it being paid out 9.917 divided by 19.92 that's equates to around 50 percent of its free cash flows are being paid as dividend so definitely the rule number two is met and now let's see how consistent that the dividends have been growing for johnson and johnson it's a really mature stock if you were to look at it we can see that johnson johnson has been paying out dividends since 1990 and it has been growing its dividends over the past 31 years at a 10-year compounding annual growth rate of 6.87 percent that's not a really good impressive growth to be honest but the consistency is just phenomenal and i don't see anything happening to this dividend because it's only accounts to 50 percent of its free cash flows meaning that the management has another 50 percent to do with the incoming cash whatever that they choose to do so that will benefit the shareholders in the long run now looking at johnson and johnson uh dividend yield wow let's have a look 2.66 percent when compared to the five-year dividend yield average of 2.64 a definitely a buy at this current valuation guys and if you were to invest in johnson johnson in march of uh, this year when it was trading at when the uh, dividend yield was around 3.42 uh, it would have been somewhere around here 119 dollars yeah 119 dollars i believe Okay, 147 divided by 119. So you would have gotten around 23% return on your investment if you had invested in this company at that time. That's not even considering your dividend yield that you would be getting, guys. And that dividend yield has a tendency to grow nearly at 6% or so year over year. Now, coming to the value proposition. So it's definitely a buy in terms of a dividend portfolio perspective at its current share price of $147.60 as a D. Okay, now let's have a look at Johnson & Johnson in terms of a value perspective. Uh, the return on invested capital is 17.05%, definitely, and we can see that it's been fluctuating here and there. Uh, back in 2017, the return on invested capital was 1.35%, but it's recovered from that level. And it's right now somewhere around 17.05% on an annualized basis. Now, coming to this one, let's see if there is consistent cash flows. Yes, but the growth rate is not something that I like because it's less than 5% according to my previous calculation. Uh, so cash flows, yes, the balance sheet, it has around $30.39 billion, which it can easily clear off with its uh, current cash flows of current assets of $45.89. 45 billion dollars and 45.89 billion dollars now let's calculate its intrinsic value so it's 5.69 that's the earnings per share and johnson and johnson has been trading at a price to earnings ratio of 15.99 379.85 and johnson and johnson they're expecting that the company should grow at 5.8 percent okay the right time to buy this company would be when it's at somewhere around 20 dollars that's the right time if you were to look at it in terms of a value perspective so you know that the company won't fall that down for sure just saying and uh, if you were to look at the current price to earnings ratio it is definitely cheaper when compared to the highest five year highest price to earnings ratio that it has been trading over the past five years that's why the discount came up here and it is cheaper when compared to the s p 500 index as well in terms of the value proposition you can consider johnson and johnson as a part of your value portfolio due to the rule number five being met so yeah home depot has only one prospects working against it working for it but johnson johnson has two aspects one is from a dividend perspective and another one is from a value perspective now let's have a look at the next company that i've selected for you guys it's intel so ticker symbol is intc 
long considered one of the leaders in the semiconductor space, Intel has been a basket uh, case in recent years. Multiple product delays, setbacks have tried shareholders' patience, but when Intel declared that its advanced 7 nanometer chips will be delayed until late 2022 or early 2023, stakeholders ran for the exit, exits, causing Intel stock to tumble badly. I'm not going to defend Intel because it is just horrible look from the heights of excellence to the depths of mediocrity. Intel stock has gone full circle. Still, I think there are some opportunities for risk tolerant contrarians due to the strength of the underlying brand. Additionally, Intel Corporation historically had shown resilience when the calendar turned on 2009. Shares found themselves down 1.9% down on an average for the decade but in the next 10 years intel corporation averaged nearly 16 percent annualized returns since 2000 share have shares have returned 6.9 percent notably higher than the s p 500 index 4.9 percent over the same period now intel i know that there's a lot of heat right now because of that particular news that they're delaying their seven nanometer technology chips and uh, AMD just started dominating the consumer space with its bang for buck processes, competing every scale on Intel, Intel's chips. So INTC, let's have a look. It's nine guys, when compared to the S&P 500 index. So definitely cheaper in terms of just looking at the price to earnings ratio. If you were to look at Intel Corporation, we can see that the revenues and the free cash flows have been increasing, but they're not increasing at a substantial rate. I would say that they're increasing at less than 5% year over year growth. And But nevertheless, the cash flows are positive. And now if you were to look at the dividends that are being paid out, 5.576 divided by 16.93, 5.576 divided by 16.93, that equates to around 30% of its Free cash flows is being paid out as dividend and the remaining 70% can be retained by the business. Now let's see how consistent Intel Corporation has been paying out dividends for its shareholders. So it has been paying out dividends since 1993 if you were to look at the stock but um, over the past six years it's been growing its dividends at a rate of somewhere around 6.96%. The growth rate isn't impressive but at least it has been paying out dividends. Uh, for this company and it is, meets the minimum criteria of five years. Just because we're really analyzing in terms of a value perspective, that's why I consider it minimum as five years. But if you want to be just basing on the dividend criteria, I would recommend looking for companies that have been paying dividends over the past 10 years, uh, which definitely is the case for Home Depot and Johnson & Johnson, right? Now, looking at Intel Corporation's dividend yield, we can see that it is currently 2.67 which is definitely a buy when compared to the five year average of 2.61. So Intel Corporation, INTC, it's a buy 48.89 in terms of a dividend portfolio. Now let's have a look at it in terms of a value perspective. Intel Corporation, the return on invested capital, it has been ranging down here and there, but on average, it is about 10% and its current return on invested capital is 20.24. And the free cash flows are positive, less than 5% growth, but we can understand to a certain extent or project the cash flows to a certain degree. But looking at the balance sheet, it has around $38 billion, which it can easily clear off with the $44.39 billion that it has. So definitely a strong balance sheet. Now let's calculate the intrinsic value of the company. 5.43. Now, if you were to look at Intel Corporation's uh, price to earnings ratio, we can see that it was around 8.790 and 26.51. And the analysts are estimating that the company should grow at somewhere around 8.62 that would put us the fair price at which we should be entering the stock at $44 per share, which is definitely a discount if you were to look at it in terms of a dividend perspective, because it's currently trading at $48, not too far away from that. We can consider buying this as a rule number four and as rule number five as well, because the current price to earnings multiple is less than 50% of the five year 
average and it is definitely cheaper from the s p 500 index as a broader market so dividend perspective yes value yes as well rule number four and rule number five is met beautiful now let's have a look at the last company guys it is ibm ticker symbol ibm once a revered stalwart in the technology space ibm has flirted with irrelevance over the years to be sure, IBM stock is the only investment among the blue chip stocks on this list that has underperformed the S&P 500 index over the past 20 years. So why bother with Big Blue? Fundamentally, I appreciate what the company is bringing to the table while shedding the image of its legacy business. IBM is moving forward with multiple innovations in cybersecurity, the blockchain, artificial intelligence, and other segments. I personally think that patient investors will be rewarded if they have patience for it, I guess. Yeah. Further, the CVPD pandemic could be the turning point for IBM stock because the crisis has forced many organizations to rethink the size of their workforce. AI will play a greater role in terms of cost savings, plus the shift towards moving everything digitally uh, has driven up demand for enterprise level cybersecurity. Okay, now let's have a look at IBM stock, ticker symbol IBM. Uh, if you were to look at it, definitely cheaper when compared to the S&P 500 index. That is for sure. Now, looking at it in terms of uh, dividend perspective, the revenues have been falling. That is not a positive sign to see for any company. So it's along with its free cash flows, but nonetheless, the free cash flows are positive. And let's see how much it comes out to 5.707 divided by 11.86. So around 50% of its free cash flows are being paid out as dividend. And I don't see any problems this continuing in the future because it is does have a pretty good cushion for it, right? In terms of its uh, dividends that's being paid out. And looking at the dividend history, we can see that IBM stock has been paying out dividends since 1990, but looking at the years of growth, it has been growing its dividends since the past 21 years at an annualized rate of 11.58%, which is pretty attractive. Uh, and looking at the current valuations of IBM in terms of a dividend yield perspective, it has a current dividend yield of 5.35%, guys. I literally kid you not, you would be getting 5.35% interest on your investment if you decide to buy this stock, which is an absolutely wonderful starting yield of 5% just by owning the stock, guys, year over year. Bananas. And as a result, it is definitely higher than the five-year average of 4.15. So definitely a buy in terms of a dividend perspective, $121.48. Definitely a buy, buy, buy. Even though the revenues and these things are falling, uh, if the IBM stock does tend to move the management pace off or like the technology that they're investing in decides to pay off, it's going to be a really good return on your investment if you buy at these levels. Now, looking at it in terms of a value perspective, typing in IBM stock here, we can see that the return on invested capital has been falling, but it is greater than 10% at the moment. And uh, the growth of the free cash flows, it's not positive and you can't project to a certain extent. But the, in terms of the balance sheet, it has around $64 billion, which it can easily clear around $40 billion with its current assets. So 64.74 minus 39.95, that would equate to around $25 billion per se. And that $25 billion um, minus 5.707, six, okay. 25 divided by six. The company would take around four years in order to clear off its long-term debt from its balance sheet. I would say that is absolutely fine. And I would still consider it as a wonderful balance sheet at the moment. Now, looking at the current, let's calculate the intrinsic value of the company. It's around the earnings per share is $8.81. And the price to earnings ratio for IBM stock um, it has been trading somewhere around 8.762 and uh, 27.68 as the highest. And the Wall Street analysts are currently estimating that IBM stock could grow at around 2.57%.
I would say that's around the same amount because it hasn't been growing that substantially and that would be like pretty reasonable because it has been losing its free cash flows year over year when compared to the past year or so. So the intrinsic value would be $56.90 and the fair price at which we should be buying the stock is $12.94. As a result, I wouldn't be considering buying the stock in terms of a, a value perspective just based on its intrinsic value calculation. But if you were to look at it as in terms of rule number five, it is definitely cheaper when compared to the S&P 500 index and it is definitely at a discount when compared to the 50% of the highest price to earnings multiple. So we can definitely consider buying this as a terms of a value perspective as well. So out of all of these 10 companies, guys, I hope I've saved you heaps of time. And these are the four companies that you should consider buying or adding to your dividend portfolio right now in terms of a dividend or a value perspective. So looking at these companies, these out of these, you can look at Intel because it meets all the criteria of, the, of our checklist. It's definitely at a bargain if Intel Corporation does do some wonders in the coming few years. It's going to just bounce back and you would be getting Intel stock uh, at a really good discount. And Johnson & Johnson and Home Depot, these are also very established companies. Make sure that you do your own research and read a little bit about companies and see if they uh, meet your, if you like any of these companies as far as you want to go ahead and invest in them. And the closing remarks for this article is that a former senior business analyst for Sony Electronics, Josh Enomato, has helped broker major contracts with Fortune Global 500 companies. Over the past several years, he has delivered unique, critical insights for the investment markets, as well as various other industries, including legal, construction management, and healthcare. On the date of publication, Josh Enomato held a long position in Altria. I didn't include Altria right now because it didn't meet the perspective of the dividend yields and I didn't want to waste you guys' time. So now, if you guys have stayed around till this part of the video, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. And just wanted to give you guys a full disclosure. This video is only for your education and entertainment purposes. I would highly recommend that you do your own research before investing in any of the four companies that I've mentioned in this article. And if you want to stay updated with all the videos that we post in this channel, just remember we post from Monday to Friday uh, around the same times. So make sure that you smash the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon so that you can get notified as soon as we post videos. See you in the next video. Peace.